Thank you, Edmund. <coughs> it is moving to see such a large audience here. And as everybody had said, very responsive and very engaging audience. I am moved by being invited here for the third time over the last 10, 15 years. And I am gratified that the center is getting more and more effective and more and more diverse in its audience. <coughs> I'm also very gratified to see Kulvis Maksud here. He is a man that I have admired all my life. And having him in the audience make me feel young. Because <laughs> when I, I'm 72 years old, but Kulvis is a few years older. And he was one of my gurus as growing up, especially uh, living here as a student activist in the 60s and 70s. Anyhow, the <coughs> I'm asked to speak on Egypt's involvement or perspective, Egyptian perspective, on what's going on in the Arab-Israeli conflict in Palestine. And I want to start with a personal note. One is that at the age of nine, I was introduced to the issue of Palestine. It was my first year to move from my village to Mansoura, the closest city, where there was a school to go to, because the village did not have one. So at the age of nine, I began to hear about Palestine, about the partition, and participated in demonstrations without fully understanding what I was demonstrated for, or against, but it tuned me from that time on, and I would live with Palestine the rest of my life. The second shot is when I was in prison. And in prison, you have all the time to listen to news, loud, small radio. So I was listening to the news and to the negotiation in Camp David. That's Camp David 2000. Having just finished a book a few months earlier, about 100 years of conflict from 17, uh, from 1897 uh, to 1947, I recognized how much I have evolved over the years in understanding that very complicated issue. But also, I got to recognize that there is a balance <coughs> between rights, which we all, as Arabs, pro-Palestinians, always talk about, and the entitlement. And rights and entitlements do not always correspond. Entitlements is when you earn something. So while uh, for a long time I believe there's only Palestinian rights, by the time I wrote my book, I have grown to realize that there are other people, Jewish people, and regardless of what they initially started with, regardless of their intention, but they have worked hard and settled in that very land that historically has belonged to the Palestinians and fought for it. And therefore, grudgingly, I came to the conclusion that they are entitled to also rights on that land. That was quite a revolution for a young Arab activist. Then, following the negotiation, having known about so many missed opportunities over the previous 50, 60 years, I realized that what was being offered in Camp David by Bill Clinton, President Clinton at the time, was probably the best compromise, humane, responsible compromise between two people who have this eternal love for the same piece of land. So by all kind of maneuvering, I was able to smuggle a letter and to get it published. It's an open letter to Yasser Arafat at the time, 
basically begging him to accept the Clinton deal. And saying, having studied that conflict, having lived with it all my life, if he did not accept that deal, there will be another 10 years before a similar or worse deal is offered. And I'm sorry to say, history has brought me out. 10 years, because I was in prison when I wrote that letter, it was in August 2000. And now, in 2010, the conflict has not seen any improvement. And the deal that was offered back then is not even offered now. Much less is offered. So that is a personal note. Where does Egypt come in? Unfortunately, in a very troubling evening, just one month before I went to prison, I was in a reception at the Moroccan ambassador's residence in Cairo. And the reception was in honor of the then Minister of Foreign Affairs of Morocco, Mohammed bin Isa an old friend from my student days in Cairo University and then veteran of Arab student politics here in the States in the 60s. So I went to that reception to see an old friend and I ran into the then Egyptian, ambas uh, Egyptian Foreign Affairs uh, Minister Amr Musa, who is now the Secretary General of the Arab League. Amr Musa is a personal friend. He took me out on the balcony of this residence, which is overlooking the Nile, beautiful residence, and said, you know, having read my book, having seen my, some of my writings, he said, what are we going to do? Should peace, peace, break out between the Palestinians and the Israelis? I said, we should celebrate. He said, what? I said, we should celebrate. He looked at me as if I'm speaking Chinese. I said, what do you mean? And what would Egypt's role be if the Palestinians and Israelis on their own reached peace? There was a talk at the time. Remember, I'm talking about April, May 2000. There was talk about pending negotiation. The one that would turn out to be the Camp David negotiation was Bill Clinton as a mediator. <coughs> I said, Amr, his first name is Amr, isn't that what we're fighting for? It is not Sadat. Trip to Jerusalem was all about to bring about peace to the whole region. And if the Israelis and the Palestinians should reach one, we should rejoice and should be happy and consolidate it. He said, okay, okay, okay. He kind of went along. He was a little bit embarrassed by my reaction. He said, could you write us a policy paper about this, of what options do we have? So I took him seriously. Following two weeks, I wrote a paper, sent it to him, and then shortly after, I went to prison. No connection <laughs> on other charges, charges that has to do with the dynasty, our dynasty. Uh. Speaking of Mubarak, Mubarak Awad, the only thing I have objection to Mubarak Awad is that his la first name coincided with our president's last name, Mubarak. Mubarak. Uh, anyhow, in uh, having heard that from Amr Musa, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Egypt, made me actually dig into other Arab regimes' attitude toward that conflict. And from 1948-49, when Arab armies returned, defeated in 1949 after the first armistice, they looked for a scapegoat. And the scapegoat was civilian, democratically elected government, governments in a number of countries like Syria, like Egypt, later on like Iraq. And they staged coup d'etats, and the coup d'etats always claimed that they were took place in the name of Palestine. So having lost Palestine was the battle cry. And these coup d'etats, military coup d'etats, were to restore Arab honor 
and to bring back Palestine to the Arab world. Great. We all believe that. We all like this. However, some 60 years later, not a single inch of Palestine was restored by these military regimes, including my own, Egypt, the biggest Arab country. So I began to realize that we need a new paradigm to understand this. And the paradigm is that the Arab autocratic regimes have no interest in either making war or making peace, but keeping the conflict going at this very low simmering point because that gives them a raison d'etre to remain in power and to muffle democratic forces in their own country. And I'm, I'm afraid that this is still the case when President Obama, distancing himself from his predecessor <coughs> by not talking about democracy or human rights, in the hope that he can enlist President Mubarak's effort to bring about peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, I think he was totally misled. If Mubarak had not moved one inch beyond what Sadat did and Rabin did some 30 years earlier, why, why would he move now? He has been in power. This is the third longest ruler in Egypt's 5,000 years history. And yet, it is very comfortable for him to be, to look like a mediator, to go through the motions, but with no movement whatsoever. He had turned Charm Sheikh, a beautiful resort on the Gulf of Suez, into a playground for who's who in world politics. So much so that he is actually giving some of the heads of state, especially when they retire, residence in Charm Sheikh. So it's a beautiful area, and he convenes all kind of mediating sessions, but no results, because he, as I discovered in the year 2000, he and his regime and other autocratic regimes in the Middle East have no interest in resolving this conflict. So what? What do we do? I think the conflict will not be resolved unless the Palestinians and the Israelis themselves come to an agreement and all the contours of a settlement are already known, known to you, known to the whole world, known to George Mitchell. And what George Mitchell did when he was faced with a similar situation in Northern Ireland, he commissioned a research center in London called the Irish Research Institute, IRI. The Irish Research Institute, even though it has that name, but it's located in London, asked that institute to actually survey what Northern Ireland, both Catholics and Protestants, would settle for. And based on what that institute concluded after several months of surveying, in-depth interviews, with normal, average human beings, he offered a package, and that package, and because he noted that politicians would always claim that their constituency will kill them if they accept a compromise. So he faced them with what their constituents really want. And the majority, both Protestant and Catholics, had wanted a compromise and were living to live with a compromise. So it is that compromise, and he said, you know, go ask your people, go ask your people. And that's what I'm concluding was. He, George Mitchell, basically did the same thing in Palestine. A few months ago, the result of a similar sur survey showed that some 58% of the Palestinians, 57% of the Israelis are willing to live with a compromise, the broad lines of which we heard over and over this morning, and he probably needs to take that bold step 
that he did in uh, Northern Ireland, and faced both the Israelis and the Palestinian leadership with the findings and asked them to go back to their constituency if they really dare to use that excuse again. And I believe that what he did in Northern Ireland is a good paradigm. He had used it also in Sri Lanka, and he seemed to, and it also worked in Sri Lanka. So that is really how I see a conclusion to the conflict. And I would have to apologize to Mubarak and his regime and other autocrats if they don't like to see, <laughs> to see an end to that conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I would like to thank to Yusuf Munayer uh, first and to Palestine Center. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, not only as a uh, policy person, but also uh, as a Turk to be involved with Palestinian issue. So that's an honor to me. Again, uh, I would like to uh, thank to the uh, people are responsible for this so I will I have like uh, four different questions so I like to go through those and then to uh, focus on why Turkey is involved with Palestinian issue uh, right now and uh, what is its uh, general position so first of all uh, Turkey's position right now should be understood uh, in the framework of broader foreign policy change uh, in Turkey. So this is a long process, but it started uh, in 2002 uh, and uh, got its dynamics uh, right after the invasion of Iraq uh, by United States, and then it continued on in the region. This new foreign policy, known uh, famously as zero problem with neighbors, based on a couple of different principles, uh, but f uh, one of them is balance between security and freedom and the respect for elections, uh, free flow of goods and people, and also multicultural existence in the region. So we can add uh, more principles to this uh, position, but eventually, at the end of the day, all these things uh, did not remain as buzzwords in Turkey's foreign policy, but turn into reality. We can discuss every one of them in uh, different cases. For example, if we take uh, Iraq, so Turkey supported multicultural existence in Iraq, supporting Yazidis, uh, Turkmen's, Kurds, Arabs living together in one of the main cities, including Kerkük, Mosul, uh, Baghdad, and other cities. So I can give these kind of examples, but this uh, sets up the ground rules for Turkey to follow any policy option uh, in the region. So therefore, Turkey's position in Palestinian issue does not only stem from or originate from a specific Palestine policy, but it is part of uh, its general broader uh, foreign policy issue. So uh, why Turkey is active in the region? Uh, the first thing is these principles. Uh, Turkey does not see its security in itself, but rather trying to create some kind of self, uh, safety and security belt uh, in the region. Uh, the other thing is, uh, according to these, uh, depending on these principles, Turkey wants to be an honest broker in the region to make this thing to happen because this security belt will not happen by itself, but needs to be followed up uh, by proactive uh, foreign policy. That's why Turkey changed its position. Instead of alienating itself from uh, its neighbors or other problems, uh, started working closely with its neighbors, including Armenia, Georgia, uh, like Greece, Russia, uh, like Palestine, Israel, and like Syria. So uh, depending on these issues, uh, therefore, Turkey uh, defined its foreign policy as a kind of uh, principle-based reali based realism. It tried to not to uh, create some kind of idealistic notion of foreign, foreign policy, but rather following these principles, try to create very concrete solutions and try to reach uh, something that might really work. And sometimes it was successful, sometimes it was, uh, it was not. 
So the uh, second uh, second part of my uh, discussion is about Turkish domestic politics, because all these things sound good, but when it comes to uh, the application of these rules, uh, the first problem, the priority of the problem was coming from Turkish domestic uh, politics. Therefore, in the last eight years, what happened in Turkish domestic politics has direct effect on uh, Turkey's foreign policy. Namely, the first thing is the democratization. I mean, the democratization efforts started with the EU process, uh, really created a, a more effective uh, like public and more effective public opinion on Turkish foreign policy. As you all may know, even though Turkey followed uh, the categorical pro-Israeli position for a long time, uh, that position was not really representing the uh, public opinion inside Turkey. But now, because of this democratization process, these kind of issues and ideas <laughs> found more space uh, in its foreign policy. And secondly, uh, in terms of domestic politics, uh, in the last three and a half years, Turkey followed uh, a kind of opening uh, policies. This means that uh, its security perception has changed because before that, Turkey saw many internal uh, like elements in its form in its domestic uh, politics inside the country as a threat uh, to the uh, state itself through the opening policies turkey tried to denationalize its own domestic uh, politics and try to recognize its own minorities and this was something very healthy because through the time it would have been extended to for example the uh, shaking the anti arab notions inside Turkey, because as you may again like all know, even though there are some uh, anti-Turkish views in the region, there was a very strong anti-Arab uh, like public opinion in Turkey. So through these opening policies, this was, uh, this was changed as well. So the other thing is, again, as I said, uh, less nationalistic, uh, less nationalistic uh, public discourse on foreign policy and politics itself. And uh, in terms of domestic politics, again, another point is Turkey, uh, after the economic crisis of 2000, turned into a uh, trading state rather than depending on uh, state and uh, financial investments. So if you're a trading state, if you, have really, uh, if you really produce something, you need to sell these products. And in order to sell these products, you have to make peace with your own neighbors. So that's why Turkey follows a policy that brings a uh, free flow of uh, goods and people. So changing the visa policies and changing the trade policies with its neighbors. Uh, therefore, Turkey was able to merge its national and economic interest with its new foreign policy. So another factor, depending on these, is the redefinition of uh, national interest. Uh, before that, Turkey's national interest mainly uh, decided by the state elites, so mainly the military and civil bureaucracy. But after these democratic reforms uh, during the 2000, uh, during the 2000, in the last eight years, uh, there was a discussion about what Turkey's national interest. And I think this discussion has been still continuing, but because of this discussion itself, now Turkey's national interest turned into a regional interest. It's not only a national interest per se, but it changed into a something more inclusive, something more uh, stability oriented to keep these gains uh, coming from the economic and uh, democratic policies. So this is the second part of my uh, presentation. So then where does really Palestine fits into uh, this foreign policy schema? So I think the, uh, the most important part of this is like Palestine uh, is a source of instability in the region. I mean, if there's an instability in the region, there like we should have some kind of status quo that at least uh, maintain the stability in the region. 
So as long as you have like Palestine issue, it is impossible to keep this stability in the region. That's why Palestine turned into one of the uh, priorities of Turkish foreign policy. I'm not talking about the political and human tragedy part of the whole issue, but rather trying to make sense of the uh, real security stuff uh, related to, related to uh, this issue. So uh, because of uh, this instability, I mean, Israel turned into a more and more unpredictable state that might really apply violence anywhere at any time. So that makes it impossible, Turkey's uh, national interest as a trading state. Because when you have embargoes, when you have blockades, when you have like visa problems, when you have these kind of citizenship issues in the region, uh, the, your policy comes to a point uh, where you really have to either change your policy or create an, uh, some kind of island of exclusivity uh, for that specific position. Instead of Turkey trying to accept uh, those problems, decided to go on with that and try to solve the real reasons of this uh, stability, uh, this instability. So here we come, uh, it comes to Turkey's Israel policy. So uh, to start with, uh, like first diagnosed uh, these problems, Turkey tried to work with Israel on a couple of different issues. Uh, tried to be more active in Palestine, tried to set up industrial zones in Ramallah, tried to like invest in Gaza, and tried to really help the, the developing infrastructure of Palestine because it may have really uh, the, uh, add up more speed to a possible solution. Uh, but I mean, the, therefore, in 2006, Turkey supported the elections uh, in Palestine and asked other parties to accept Hamas as the legitimate elected reality of uh, Gaza. So this changed, of course, uh, like all the uh, dynamics uh, for Turkey in the region. So the second step uh, in this policy, uh, i.e. the engaging with Israel, was the Israeli-Syrian uh, negotiations. So because Turkey, since Turkey has a comprehensive approach to this issue, uh, this should be solved uh, like simultaneously uh, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Palestine itself. So therefore, try to be more involved in Lebanon, but at the same time, try to help Syria and Israel to solve their problems to support possible Palestinian uh, solution. But you all remember the uh, reaction of Israel to this uh, policy. This was the 2006 Lebanon War and 2008 uh, the led Operation Kastled. So again, uh, what, happened, uh, what happened really uh, eventually at the end of the day changed Turkey's own security and threat perception in the region. Right now, Turkey, uh, this is of course my reading, is convinced that First of all, Israel should be a normal state in the region, i.e. should not be the source of instability. I mean, I don't know how many of you follow that closely, but last week there was a discussion in Turkey about the Turkey's strategic security concept. So similar to NATO's strategic concept, Turkey reviews this document every five years and makes the decision and then goes ahead with that. So in uh, last week, a couple days ago, uh, after those negotiations, Syria, Bulgaria, Georgia, and Armenia are no longer among Turkey's list of external threats. But in return, now, Israel, Israel's action in the Middle East is a source of threat uh, to Turkey, at least in the, five, in the next five more years. So Turkey defined this position not as a categorical position, but as a uh, defined Israel as a instability in the region, uh, I'm sorry, this document draws attention to the instability in the region caused by Israel and the possibility that Israel's action may lead the countries in the region to be engaged in an arms race. So uh, therefore, uh, since Turkey was not able to uh, engage with Israel through this process, uh, changed its all security perception in the region and defined Israel 
not as a categorical, but as a practical uh, potential uh, source of threat to its own security. So what needs to be done? I mean, that was the question uh, really Turkey asked, especially after the like couple of events starting from like Operation Kastled and then followed by the chair crisis and then flotilla issue and all these things. So Turkey uh, like evaluated the uh, the position and eventually came up with couple of uh, couple of like principles. First of all, it's so clear that Israel does not abide by the rules of international law and it sees itself above the law. So the first thing should be done is to <laughs> make this clear first and then follow the case, like follow the course, depending on this evaluation. So after that, even though it's very costly for Turkey to have some kind of tension with Israel, there is no solution to solve this problem in the region. Otherwise, Turkey uh, might have turned into another states in the region that cannot deliver, cannot do anything, but just uh, obeys the uh, obeys the rules of Israel. Let's say. So, how to deal with Israel? The first thing is principled position. That's why Turkey follows a principled position. It says, I mean, if Israel does such and such and such, then we will have such and such relationship. It's not categorical rejection, and it's not. Uh, it's not accepting Israel's term. And secondly, it's uh, like Turkey decided to take responsibility. I mean, don't think that Turkey has problems only in the region, but in the United States, Turkey uh, like has other relations with the Jewish community and the Israeli lobby uh, in the United States in Washington. So the cost that Turkey really takes uh, have some effects on its own, uh, like, bureaucratic elites, elites, and also it harms its relations with United States. But at the end of the day, Turkey decided to take that responsibility and follow the course again. Uh, thirdly, Turkey decided to again distance itself from any categorical approach. Because when it comes to categorical approach, if you really start talking about uh, the Israel as such, then it creates a legitimacy problem, which really not the problem of Turkey, because Turkey doesn't have that kind of burden. So it's very uh, like easy to criticize Israel because of this issue. And uh, the last thing is uh, the f to follow. Uh, that's <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> I have three minutes. I'll be finished shortly. So then Turkey decided to have some kind of roadmap, which never done to Israel before, uh, and tried to use the lingo, vocabulary of uh, the international relations, i.e., I mean, the, uh, like, you know what are those, the embargoes, uh, like blockades or reducing the diplomatic relations and such. So first result was, uh, like, Turkey wanted Israel to uh, do all bunch of different stuff related to flotilla, but after that, it asked certain things and then uh, reduce the relations gradually. So first thing is, it's, uh, the Israeli uh, like military planes used to use uh, Turkish airspace. First, these things uh, depended on uh, like specific, like particular uh, like permission, depending on every single flight. And then there came Turkish airspace close to like any uh, like military flights. And then uh, what happened, uh, the, for example, missile defense system. I mean, these are the rumors, and I read these from newspapers as well. But Turkey says, for example, in missile defense system, uh, this intelligence that was gathered uh, by the system should not be shared with Israel. So Israel should be excluded from this region up until it proves that it's not a source of instability. So uh, eventually, I will say this and finish my presentation, uh, Turkey is trying to force Israel to take the issues of uh, security seriously and tries to work with the powers in the region more closely. And uh, when doing this, trying not to lose its own legitimacy. So thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure being here. I want to thank Youssef and the Palestinian Center here for um, organizing this very, very important opportunity to be able to have a conversation about this issue. 
outside of what is usually the context of this conversation, which is solely to view it from the perspective of the United States, Israel, and a few Arab actors, but actually take a greater look at the regional context because the regional players are becoming increasingly important uh, to this issue. It was mentioned earlier that many of the um, autocratic Arab states have neither an interest in going to war nor in making peace, essentially utilizing the conflict for their own purposes, which in this specific case was regime survival. In the case of Iran's posture towards Israel, it is actually not particularly different from that either. The Iranian state, for its own purposes, has had its own involvement in this issue, which rarely has been driven by any particular desire to sacrifice Iranian interests for the sake of the Palestinians. Rather, the Iranians have had a very clear agenda when it comes to their activities in this area, uh, which is driven by several different factors, and I think this is very important to understand, particularly when it comes to understanding Iran's posture in the region as a whole. Iran views itself, and is oftentimes used by others in the region, as a majority Shiite Persian state in a sea of either Arabs or and Sunnis. And this creates for the Iranians in a very astute sense of strategic loneliness, a sense of no strategic depth, and mindful of its own history of having had a significant number of foreign interventions in its internal affairs, a certain level of paranoia that makes everything all the more complicated. In addition to that, however, the Iranians are also uh, dealing with the burden of an identity that says that they, due to their history, due to their um, resources, their strategic positioning, are destined to play a leadership role in the region. Because in the last, most of the last 3,000 years of Iranian history, Iran has been a major regional power. Whether you have a Shah, an Ayatollah, or a democratically elected prime minister in Iran, this will very much be part of the picture when Iranians are making their foreign policy. Palestine and the Israeli-Palestinian issue has oftentimes come at the center of this, in which many of these different driving forces either collide with each other or have been able to reinforce each other. There's a couple of other facts I need to mention before going forward as well, just to make sure I don't give too dry of a picture of what is taking place. There is an overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian sentiment amongst the vast majority of the Iranian population. This was incidentally even more strongly viewed during the time of the Shah when the Shah had very, very strong security ties with the Israelis and this was something that was largely resented by the Iranian population as a whole. However, the sentiments in favor or in the sentiments of being sympathetic to the Palestinian side does not necessarily translate into a view that Iran actually should have an active role in this issue. Large segments of the population have sympathies with the Palestinians, but do not believe that this is something that Iran should be directly involved with because of Iran's own problems much, much closer to home. Furthermore, the threat that the Iranians, in the past at least, have sensed from Arab nationalism uh, is not something that has escaped the Iranian psyche. And that is part of the reason that from the Iranian perspective, with the uh, victory of the Iranian revolution, there was a very strategic and deliberate attempt by the Iranians to recast the Israeli-Palestinian issue away from being an Arab nationalist cause into being an Islamic cause. Because by changing it from an Arab nationalist cause, you take away the ability of mobilizing for that issue at some point being turned into negative sentiments towards Iran as a non-Arab state in the region, but also because of the leadership aspirations of the Iranians, the Iranians recognize that you cannot be a leader in this region if you don't have a role in the most important conflict of the region, which is the Arab-Palestinian conflict. In fact, about 10 days after the Iranian revolution in February 1979, Yasser Arafat showed up uninvited in Tehran with a delegation of approximately 40 Palestinians from the PLO. 
He was met by some of the revolutionaries uh, in Tehran, and a couple of hours later, there was a two-hour session with Ayatollah Khomeini, which by all accounts was a very negative meeting. The two did not get along. Khomeini was lecturing Arafat about the necessity of turning the Palestinian cause into an Islamic issue, uh, which Arafat, as I understood, did not have much of an appetite for. But the Iranians sought to do this on the one hand because of their fear of Arab nationalism and because of their desire to be a leader in the region. And if the, Arab, if the Israeli-Palestinian issue was defined as Arab, where was Iran's role in it? But if it was defined as an Islamic issue and with Iran having more, cap uh, more ammunition when it comes to political Islam than any other state at the time in the region, then that gave Iran a very, very favorable position to start off from. Now, the dynamics when it comes to how these different driving forces are affecting Israeli-Palestinian issue have gone through several different phases. Throughout the 70s, even into the 80s, uh, there was still a lot of collaboration between Israel and Iran behind the scenes and sometimes openly. And that was because the security concerns of the Iranian state was overriding its ideological uh, Im uh, imperatives and its desire for leadership. Uh, but by the 1990s, because of a change situation in the region geopolitically, with the defeat of the Soviet Union, the collapse, uh, the defeat of uh, Saddam Hussein, which essentially made sure that there was no longer any conventional military threat posed to Iran and to Israel by an Arab state that gave the Iranians and the Israelis a common Arab threat. With that gone, a new order was emerging in the region in which the Iranians increasingly started to view the Israelis as a threat and vice versa. And ever since, particularly because of the linkage that uh, was presented in Washington by the Israelis and adopted by the Clinton administration, the linkage between Israel and Iran, the Israeli-Palestinian issue in Iran, and the linkage was that the more peace you have between Israel and Palestine, the more Iran would be isolated. The more you isolate Iran, the more peace you would have between Israel and Palestine. That linkage, which was the linkage of marrying the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, the Oslo process, with the dual containment policy, the policy of isolating Iraq and Iran, that created all the incentives in the world for the Iranians to do everything they could to undermine the peace process, not for the sake of any particular sympathy with any faction in the Palestinians, but because of avoiding a success of the American policy of putting Iran in a prolonged state of isolation. And it's at that time you see the Iranians significantly increase uh, uh, support for Palestinian factions that were doing everything they could to undermine the peace process. But it's important to note here that there's a conclusion drawn, a simplistic conclusion drawn in Washington uh, that says that essentially the Iranians, as a result of their position, are against peace per se, or to make the comparison to with the Arab autocratic governments, that they're against any settlement of this because they view that as a potential threat to their uh, continued existence. That does not seem to necessarily be the case in the case of the Iranians. And I think it would be instructive to take a look at the Iranian profile in 1994 vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli-Palestinian issue and the Iranian profile in the year 2000 during the Camp David II talks. In 1994, the people who today are considered reformists, even part of the Iranian opposition, the more liberal-minded Iranian officials, were the very same officials who were out praising every Hamas bombing that killed Israeli civilians and were doing everything short of taking credit for the violence taking place in the area. And that was again done out of a fear that if this was successful, Iran would be uh, next in, uh, would be essentially boxed in in prolonged isolation. By the year 2000, however, you had a remarkably different uh, Iranian profile. You had a situation in which uh, at Camp David, there was at least in some quarters, some hope that some sort of a final settlement could come out. But the Iranians were not extremely active in any way, shape or form in trying to undermine it. Their rhetoric was very muted at the times. And the fundamental reason, there's several factors obviously, but the most important reason as to why you had a very different Iranian profile was because of the fact that the Iranians in that time period had managed to significantly improve their relations with the Arab world, particularly with Saudi Arabia. 
and secondly, improve their relations with the European states in a very, very extensive manner, which meant that at that point, any resolution to the conflict was not perceived as a strategic threat to the Iranians because they had already secured their position in the region and did not fear that uh, peace between Israel and Palestine would end up uh, in uh, leading to Iran's isolation. Now, going forward, we have to obviously keep in mind that there's some significant changes that have taken place in Iran, particularly since last year. It is, we should keep in mind that when looking at Iran's foreign policy going forward, looking at past activities is helpful, but we should be careful not to draw too strong of a uh, conclusions from that, because there has been changes in the Iranian foreign policy establishment with completely new outlooks, completely new ideologies, uh, and uh, modus operandi that have entered in there uh, that could potentially change it, at least in the short term. I doubt that it will change it dramatically in the long term. But the one interesting factor that has happened uh, is actually the emergence of Turkey. Emergence of Turkey as another state that is breaking the uh, the regular pattern of seeing most states in the region that are close U.S. allies to either be quiet or quietly collaborate with efforts that their own populations are overwhelmingly against, leaving a significant amount of space for countries like Iran uh, to be able to play on the sentiments on the Arab streets, which the Iranians will do going forward regardless, because as a, as a country aspiring to be a leader in the region, their sensitivity to sentiments on the Arab streets are quite strong. But now you have a state that actually, in contrast to the Iranians who actually have a categorical rejection of Israel, rather has a state like Turkey, as Nu explained, has a principled approach to it, saying that certain relations can change if behaviors change, rather than the positions that the Iranians have taken. This could have a significant impact on the way that Iran manages to utilize discontent on the Arab streets uh, in order to put pressure on the United States, in order to put pressure on some of the Arab governments that Iran itself is at odds with, and in order to be able to utilize the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for its own uh, uh, national interest purposes. That's the big question mark going forward. That's going to be very, very interesting to see. And so far, it's been um, um, almost amusing to see how the Iranians at times have seen uh, what the Turks have been doing on this area as kind of coming in and stealing their show, but doing so much better of a job at it. Thanks so much.